Well, hello and welcome to the last session of the uh, Gloucestershire and South Gloucestershire Business Insights Festival, which is designed to try and look at various aspects of business and, and, and life in general uh, in and around the Gloucestershire and, and South Gloucestershire area. Um, if you're watching this live on YouTube, hello. If you're watching this later um, from the recording, it's January the 20th, which is about four o'clock UK time and UK time is relevant because one of our guests is in America. It's the day that Joe Biden is about to become president. So um, an historic day. And as all of us have got journalistic and news interests, we all love the big days. So it's a very exciting one. Um, just to introduce myself and then I'll get the panel to do the same. Uh, my name, as you can probably see, is Sam Holliday. I'm the development manager for the um, Federation of Small Businesses, the FSB in Gloucestershire and the West of England. So I deal with a lot of business issues for what is Britain's biggest business representation group. But prior to that, um, I spent more than 25 years, can't believe it, can you? But it's true, um, in newspapers. I was a, a very passionate media person, started in my native Midlands, then moved down to the Bath area. And I was editor for about half that time of, of some very great newspapers, um, two which went on to become the uh, UK weekly newspapers of the year. So uh, I love newspapers, always have done, and I love the media and always have done. So um, what we're doing today is we're gonna be discussing what does the media look like now and what's it going to look like in the future? And to do so, we've put together a very good panel, um, which I'm going to introduce yourself. Uh, Louise, by the way, you can probably see she's coordinating things from behind. She won't be contributing, but thank you anyway, Louise. Um, so um, I'm Sam. That's Louise. Um, John, would you like to introduce yourself and tell people what exotic location you're speaking from? <laughs> thank you, Sam. Um, my name is John Hewitt-Jones. I'm a senior reporter at Inside PNC, um, which is an invest investive newswire that covers the property and casualty insurance and reinsurance markets um, in the UK and the US and a couple of other international markets also. Um, and it's part of Euro Money Institution Investor, which is a British um, FTSE 250 publishing house. Um, uh, yes, and I'm based here in New York City. I was working in London before, um, but uh, I, yeah, I'm very passionate about the economics of media and actually started my career um, on the Gloucester Citizen um, uh, working as a kind of uh, intern. So um, I'm very, very uh, interested in, and uh, passionate in the cause of regional media and, and Gloucestershire. And um, yeah, so that's that's my background. Perfect. Thank you, John. Ex a very exciting story you've already had. Um, and talking to the Gloucester Citizen, for a man who knows that paper extremely well, um, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Sam. I worked on the Citizen. In fact, the Citizen actually brought me to Gloucestershire more than 20 years ago. So I started on the Citizen. I worked for the Gloucestershire Echo and, and the Forester, all the papers within its little sort of Gloucestershire sort of basket. Um, and I helped it launch the uh, first business news website for the county, to sort of business magazines like Southwest Business and an Agenda. Um, so I worked on those. Um, and then after a spell on that, that sort of morphed into various websites, which is now sort of uh, 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 some sort of Gloucestershire Live. So I worked for Gloucestershire Live too. And then moved on to Punchline, an independent news website. Uh, for Gloucestershire and then last year the start of the pandemic I launched uh, the Rakes Journal which my own operation which was an, um, an editorially led business news website to support uh, business through the pandemic that was this kind of sort of glorious sort of goal um, I like to think it sort of did that in its own way so much so that um, it drew the attention of SoGloss uh, which is a far bigger platform it's like uh, you might say sort of the biggest independent um, uh, sort of news platform in the county. It's actually Gloucestershire based and they are um, sort of lifestyle magazines, what's on events, etc. Um, but they also do some business coverage, um, especially now they've sort of, uh, they bought the Rakes Journal operation in house. So, so that's effectively myself and the team there. They've got the business awards coming up this year. So, uh, 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 for the county, uh, which will be a big, sort of big event, I think. Um, and yeah, the so the idea really is to provide a platform to champion business um, and to sort of turn journalism, uh, you know, the tool of journalism, to to that effect really. And that's you know that's my job, and I love it. Excellent. Well, in a way, if you like, if I represent uh, the past, the media, and Andrew and John, very much the current. What about the future? Um, we're delighted that, uh, to be joined by Lois today. Um, well, Lois, do you want to tell people who you are and how you came to be with us? 
Yeah, hi, I'm Lois Cooper. I'm a first year journalism student at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, so I don't have as much experience of it as everyone else, but I'm just right at the start now. And I actually got in contact because I'm doing an internship, which is how I got in contact with the County Business Show and is how I ended up here. Brilliant. Well, hopefully we've got quite a range of, 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 of um experience levels here but also quite a range of opinions which I, I think is, is very exciting so um we talked then about the past and the present and the future and um if we go back not that many years ago um newspapers which is the route that myself and andrew came through um were king uh, but now obviously we as we're proving we're doing this everything is moved online the print still has a role so I, do you know what? i'm going to start with that question because i've heard it i've, I've been on panels about this going back years um is print dead very simple. Is print dead? Um, Andrew, would you like to start? Because you're like me, you, you'll probably love print. Is print dead? Yeah, you always feel a bit like a sort of dinosaur if you're saying, no, it isn't, don't you? And wait for people to point the finger. But but it isn't. Uh, but it, I think it does depend on what you're talking about. And I think in Gloucestershire, it isn't. Uh, there are, um, you know, there are some publications which will show that it isn't. But um, so definitely huge growth in audience online um and i think it will remain so you know i think it will be the dominant source will be so the dominant uh sort of platforms will be found online but if you go out of gloucestershire into some other areas as i was saying the other day like so, uh, as, uh, the business desk which is a manchester based um sort of outfit you know that is entirely online and the business community there they so i gather they don't go near print really um you know it's all put through um it's all put through online platforms so uh, so definitely um sort of not dead but perhaps um just one part of the big picture now would be my view that's that's a very interesting perspective because I, I mean I, I found that probably like the rest of us i've had more time um because of lockdown more time at home and i've actually almost rediscovered news papers um and i and i love to read i love to read the weekend papers the times and the sundays on which i never read before for me uh, and and i appreciate quality now quality print journalism so um i think maybe uh, from my point of view i think the print isn't dead but it's got to be better because you're up against this this titan online so um john i i never quite know whether the states is ahead or behind us when it comes to things like media so how is print treated in uh america and do you perceive that print as a, as a news medium is dead or, or has it got a different role to play? Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question, Sam. Um, I, I will be slightly evasive and, and respond by saying maybe, um, but actually the the trade of information uh, is is as, um, as vibrant as it ever has been. Um, it's the case now that um, with the technological advances we've made, I think the medium has become less important and people are beginning to realize the value of information. Um, in, in, in what I do, for example, working for a trade newswire, um, we, you know, my job is to find information from opaque markets and um, to publish it, which then people can then trade off. They use that information to make, you know, they use the quality or well-sourced information to make good business decisions. And I think whether it's B2, we're talking about B2B or whether we're talking um, about direct consumer media, you know, the message is still the same. Same people, people who are do recognise um, uh, quality information, and I think we're reaching a point also where the tide around or uh, people, um, the impact of social media and public discourse has changed a bit, and it's meaning that people are now you know really beginning to value quality information. Um, which and what you know, what does that look like? Well, it might look like. You know, paying paying for a subscription to a quality daily newspaper or a particular niche news website that gives you exactly the information you're trying to to or you 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 wish to wish to seek in order to help make good decisions. Um, in in terms of your point about you know how how the U.S. market has um, what the U.S. market looks like here, um, I think I think to a degree it is more advanced than than the U.K. Um, but I think that's partly a function of you know there being a larger market and also. The greater influence of capital markets. Um, you know, you look at some of the, the the big news operations here in the U.S. The the entrepreneurship and the kind of new startups. A lot of them have the same kind of money, the same kind of backing that like Twitter or Google or like 
Facebook had when they started out, you know, these big, you know, funds that exist to, to plow money into new ventures. And, and I think that's especially noticeable at the regional level. Like there are, there are startups, there are regional startups here. I was in Ithaca um, at the weekend up in, in uh, upstate in, in New York state. And, you know, they've got three or four like local newspaper startups that are all like, you know, they've received independent backing, independent funding and and, and the community are contributing and, and willing to take out subscriptions. And yeah, I, I don't I don't see that happening in the same way in the UK. And and, and I yeah, I think I think there's opportunity there. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I remember when I used to go to London 20 years ago for a day trip or something, you'd go on the tube and you'd never see anybody's face because they're all reading the standard or, or a national newspaper. Now you see the people top of people's heads because they're all looking at their phones and you hardly see mm. a newspaper. But um, I remember when I was right at the end of my uh, editorship up in Bath, I went to talk to a group of kids um, and I remember saying to them, how many people have, have been in the newspaper? And quite a lot of hands went up and I was quite encouraged by that. They might've been in a sports team or at a fate or something. I said, how many people have, have had stories about them online? Again, a similar amount of numbers. And I just asked them randomly, and I don't know where this question came from, what meant more to you? And they all said they liked the physical thing. It's something you can keep and show people. Um, and I remember going back years and years, it would be, I remember I'd say to people who'd ring up, oh, we might not have room in the paper, we'll put it on our website. And they were horrified. Well, no, I want my nanny to see it. I want my auntie to see it. And so there was still something physical. So I still think there's something to play. But if I come to Lois, I mean, Lois, I mean, I've got um, two children in their 20s. Despite my background, they'd never buy a newspaper ever this is not on their radar so as a student looking at potential future job opportunities are newspapers on your radar at all um i think they are i don't think that newspapers are or print media is fully is dead i think it's definitely declining and um but they would be on my radar i just think they do need a reputation behind them because i do think people experiment with the digital version because they are accessible and they're right in front of you you don't they're not hard to get your hands hold like to get hold of um whereas with some newspapers like the guardian for example like you're still paying to view it online mm -hmm. um but you but people don't mind doing it because of the reputation behind the guardian i think that if the reputation wasn't there then the print version wouldn't or the digital version really wouldn't survive but i think people do go for the print uh, digital versions more because they are so accessible and because of people's fast-paced lives like it's just so easy to flick onto your phone and just take a quick read read through and then put your phone away so i think there's definitely a decline but i wouldn't say they're they're dead completely yeah, it's good. To, good. To, uh, it's interesting that point about brand and um, your brand is so important. It's, it's what people buy into. So um, let, let's talk about that, that about the digital versions and about we're all interested in business to, 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 to various degrees. Um, I remember, again, going back to I went to an editor's conference once and you, you have like a menu of events you can go to. And, you know, some would have this amount of people, some would have that amount of people. And there was one session saying how to make money from from the Web with news rammed it's standing room only and we had somebody from the daily mail there somebody from the guardian somebody from uh, i think the financial times and i tell you what we we're all there poised there with our pads and our pens and we rarely wrote down anything because it's still at that point was difficult to work out so how can we make money when when uh, from how do we monetize news if in fact you should ever do that so i'll, I'll come to you first john what do, what do you think how how do you monetize digital news when no one's paying a, you know, their 50p for their newspaper or their dollar, whatever? I think, Sam, um, um, I think you, in maybe our, one of our pre-conversations, you, you, you mentioned it, but it is, it is all about the value of the content. Mm. Um, thinking about it, you know, from a business news standpoint, um, people understand that to make good decisions, you have to have high quality information. And I think the same. I, I'm I'm of the of the opinion that the same can be said about um, you know co consumers, about people people consuming um, you know political news or or local regional news. Like people people want to be good citizens. They they understand the importance of of scrutinising the the 
the structures, the local government, the the communities in which they live. Um, and I think I think the the key is not worrying is is actually worrying less about the medium and and thinking f- much more about the value of the content and persuading um, and and then you know then persuading people to pay for it. Um, there's a, a media uh, a, a, a media executive who um, who I worked under briefly who who would always always talk talk about like the three pronged stool of um, you know content commercial and marketing. And I actually think that's very, very true. And, and you know, we've, we've got very held up. Uh, we've got very obsessed with the impact of, of social media on, 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 on the fast paced news cycle on, on, um, on the way that people consume news. But the fundamental economics haven't changed. If you have something that people, that people don't know and they need to know, um, you, you can persuade them to pay for it. I'm, I'm of that opinion, absolutely. Whether it's at the regional level, the local level, or as I say, you know, covering a financial market. And I think it's a question of doubling down on the quality, slowing down, um, you know, providing information that people don't have, and then going to them with like a valuable, like clear proposition, you know, saying that, you know, you've got this, this will provide you with, you know, a select few stories that have a really significant, meaningful impact on your life. And in return, we expect, like, we'll ask you to pay like, you know, 10 pounds a month or five pounds a month, whatever it is. Um, I think yeah, being more interested. honest about the value value proposition. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that's quite interesting. We, we've already discussed this, but it, it was an example that I I've got myself into. Uh, uh, for those who are big football fans who might be watching this, um, there was a point two years ago now when practically every leading writer on a regional newspaper that covered a club left. They all left and they joined this thing called the Athletic, which I'd never heard of before, which is like a collection, an American-based co- uh, company. Um, that tries to bring together all the, the best writing and then you have to pay for it. So with all these people have built up a following and, and I now pay every month so I can read about the people, buy the people I want to read about the subjects I'm interested in. So it can happen. So I, I want to come to Andrew here because you took um, the decision to launch um, a new news website last year called The Rakes Journal. I will ask you, by the way, in case anyone's watching or, or have followed you and don't know, to explain the title. Uh, but... Did you ever at all think, right, I am going to make this a subscription model. I'm going to make people pay for the quality content. Or was that never on your radar? I did think about it. Um, I think in the right... I think uh, from where I was starting from, it wasn't going to happen like that. But I do think it's a goer, personally. Uh, It's just, um, you know, I do think a subscription model is a goer. I think... um, um, I know that so the newspapers in this county, they don't actually have any reporters working for them at all, strictly speaking. So as far as the business model is concerned, those, you know, those reporters work under the online model and, and the newspaper kind of takes the stories across like that. Um, and that's because of, of, um, of uh, uh, the income, you know, that they can't get through uh, the online model yet to balance it up i mean but with something i was uh, the model i chose to do i looked at a few models there are different models out there i found one which worked from so coming from where i was starting from um and i knew it was going to sort of work here because i know the market well enough and it did um but i think you um it's like john was saying it's john was saying that uh, you need the content, you know, so people aren't just going to pay for something. You need to establish it first. You need to build that content, uh, build that reputation, that credibility. And if you get the right content and credibility, I think that builds around the platform as well. You know, so people want to be part of that. And there were a lot of businesses in the county who were, who were prepared to support that, uh, you know, put their money up front with me. And, and you know, so they did want that to happen and they supported it. Um, and that's what actually made it happen. You know, it sort of did work commercially. Um, so, um, but I don't Do you know think whether ed- editors nowadays, or, or if you're launching stuff like this, have to be more commercial minded than they may have been in the past, where their only focus was on the front page headline, if you like. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm uh, in the so I'm not. Um, you know, people will tell you I'm no salesperson, <laughs> but I think um, it's what it was with me is I just 
um, I had a very honest proposition and I just said it to people and, and the people I said it to sort of know me well enough and liked it. Um, but I, I think it's probably just like the, the editorial teams have been stripped down and they wear different hats. You know, In the past, you would have just written copies. Somebody else would have checked it and subbed it. Somebody else would have put it onto a page. Well, now you do the whole thing in the same way as an editor, uh, you know, has to be commercial now. They have to be commercially minded, I think. Uh, no matter what platform they sat, and they probably always were. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I remember how the sparks flew between the editors and the commercial sort of bosses from time to time, but that was a kind of healthy relationship on the whole. Perhaps you'll tell me otherwise, but I think, you know, that sort of those two roles have just come together now in a large part, and everyone has to think commercially. Um, just going back to what you were saying, I, I, at the organisation I now work for, so Sogloss was telling me um, about how one of the people that used to cover content for us regularly, you know, what, um, it was one of the big entertainment venues in the county, it used to regularly write about it, and it turned around one day and, um, and said, you know, you're going to have to start supporting us on this, we're giving you, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds worth effectively of coverage. And um, it took a little while, but the penny dropped. And now I think a lot of people think like if they have, a, if you run a credible platform, if you have good content, if you treat it with care, if you do it professionally, then they see the value in that, you know, as part of their overall uh, sort of reach. So, um, no, that makes it in, in a line, Rakes Journal, for those that don't know. Why was it called the Rakes Journal? Um, it's named after Robert Rakes, who was. Um, an editor from Gloucester who allegedly was the man who came up with freedom of the press because he was hauled up to uh, hauled up to London a few times when he started reporting on the likes of of uh, the labor strikes in the mills of Stroud and such like but he was also an altruistic kind of guy and a very locally orientated um, chap so amongst other things he was a complex character but let's leave it there <laughs> he was but he was also because this is how I know it he was um he was the founder of the of um, Sunday schools. He was famous for starting Sunday schools in this country. So he was, yeah. Well, that, quite a character. There was actually two Robert Rakes. There was him and his father. But yeah, he started yeah. that. Which blimey, what a family! Uh, 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 which some people also claim actually was fueled the Industrial Revolution because he helped educate the masses. Mm. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, so he's an interesting character. Yeah, yeah. He was. Great name for a magazine. Um, so, so Lois, what, what what about you? Could you ever envisage? paying for news or do you feel there's so much good quality free news out there that you won't have to dip your hands into your meager student grant <laughs> um i think that is good news out there that is free and accessible for people but like as john and andrew were saying if if an outlet has a product that you want you will be willing to pay for it mm -hmm. so i think subscriptions do definitely work with news outlets because if they've got the information you want on that, like a small price isn't going to hit you off like to get that information. Um, I think like there are plenty of news sites that are out there, but obviously they monetize their content through different ways, such as ads and stuff, which I think people do pay subscriptions for because ads are quite annoying um, sometimes. So people do pay um, for subscriptions that way, just mainly to get rid of ads sometimes, um, which I've I've done before. Um, so I don't think that there's much of a barrier um, if there is a subscription, um, because people are willing to pay them, and it has been evidenced through many of the outlets. So, well, I mean that, that's the Spotify model, isn't it? You can have Spotify for free. If you want bells and whistles, no ads, you pay for it. And a lot of people do. And in fact, before we started recording this session, we were just talking about Netflix that have today announced record profits. Um, and and they their subscriptions have gone through the roof. And that's because people are willing to pay for good quality stuff. Um, so let's just have a look at the nature of news, because that, I think, has changed. I mean, I, I think in the days that we were involved in the media more, I was involved and, and Andrew was in newspapers, we were fiercely independent. No, no, no reader ever felt that way i'll never forget the first time i left my hometown camera because i was a newspaper editor there a labor council pulled me aside and said now you're going you can admit it you're a tory aren't you and about two days later a tory said to me 
we're glad you're going because we've always known you've been a Labour guy. Uh, and it was always like that. It was every editor always had the same. That everybody thought they were biased against them. And that's because we really tried to steer an independent path. But what I'd like to ask you guys, from your experience, particularly interested in from the American perspective, actually, is do people want independent news now? Because in my experience, some of the people that say to me, why isn't the BBC more left or more right, um, aren't really saying that they want it to be independent. They want it to be more like them. So do is there a, still a thirst for independent news or do people want news that reflects what they already feel and their, their current prejudices? So um, I'll, I'll start with you, actually, uh, Lois. Do, do you feel there's still a thirst for independent news or, or do people switch off for things that just not that doesn't back their worldview? What do you think? Um, I think that is there is a thirst for some independent news but obviously people like reading things that agree with their perspective and their models um so they are going to seek out news content that aligns with that i think there is a there is definitely a thirst for independent news um because they can they have i feel they have more freedom in what they can write whereas other news groups that are owned by major conglomerates Conglomerate, yeah. yeah, yeah um, so they um they're more restricted in what they can say. Um, so I think there is an equal thirst for both, but overall people do drift towards news that agrees with their worldview and perspective, most definitely. Yeah, I mean we've always had it to a certain extent. I mean you can identify the national newspapers that you would think were left leaning, right leaning, centrist leading, but I think in America, going to you, Johnny, it's a bit more defined than that, isn't it? There are in, in newspaper terms, there are Republican newspapers or Democrat newspapers in a local area. Um, and there's also uh, new, uh, stations as well that are the same, aren't they? I mean, CNN and, and Fox, for example, are regarded as being very different in terms of the demographic and the people that get it. So do you get in America that sense that people want this independent, the, the old fashioned BBC concept? Or do people like news that reflects what they already believe? Well, the big the big difference in America is um, is that the well, firstly, the First Amendment protects, you know, the freedom, freedom of speech, um, which means that the discourse tends to be a lot more. Um, it it help it, it aids the polarization of discussion and discourse, right? You don't have, um, you know, a, a regulator like Ofcom fact checking um, uh, information that's broadcast in the same way here, here in the US, um, which has, to a degree, led to the kind of elision of um, of opinion and and factual broadcasting. Um, and that's yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, well, I don't know. I again, it depends. It depends what you ask, right? Like, um, it, it 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 makes it easier as a journalist to, to to run tricky stories. Like like the bar for defamation and libel is is a lot higher here. Um, but it also has, I, I believe, it has helped the um, uh, the forces that we've seen have have really contributed to this polarization of, of discussion. Um, one thing, I, one thing, just from my sort of you know day to day uh, perspective as, as a financial trade journalist, um, I think I, it, people I've, I've come across. I mean, you, you guys you know must um, have come across this in in your roles as, as kind of editors on regional newspapers. But you know, is this funny um, cognitive dissonance in that you know the readers are desperate and hungry for information? Um, but they desperately don't want, you know, their secrets to get out. And that's something, you know, covering like, you know, writing, doing M&A stories or like, you know, covering quite opaque financial markets, like you really have to struggle with. Like, you know, you'll be trying to source information that's under NDA or that's confidential um, and you'll get, you know, like threats or whatever from some, you know, companies with massive balance sheets. But on the other hand, they're like, you know, the same people who are like sending you legal letters or whatever will often be the people who have like the largest subscriptions who are like, you know, the most avid consumers of your product. Um, of the news products, which I think, you know, translates into the direct, you know, to consumer market in that people, people are hungry for information and they want to know, like, they want to know what's going on around them and they want to understand what's going on around them. But it's just that kind of getting them to showing them that they either have to, you know, pay for it or that requires allowing journalists to do their job is a different, a different matter, I think. Um, so that's just something I've, I've kind of noticed, you know, um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a fascinating subject because it would never have even been an issue many years ago. But um, how do you see it, Andrew? Do you feel that people have still still want that straight down the line journalism, or, or do, do pe have people moved on and want something that reflects more their their prejudices one way or the other? 
It's a good question, isn't it? I suppose it it's probably start. You know, what is straight down the line journalism? Um, but but um, I think that that um, it's not so much the straight down the line. I think it's it's the people knowing. You know, to, you're being honest about where you're coming from. So if you're a right wing platform or a left wing platform, or whatever. As long as that's sort of apparent um, and it's not over the top, I think people can kind of stomach that and always have. Um, I think there are, if you want, if you want the news reporter to be the personality who's sort of in the story somewhere, then there's probably room for that as well. Whether you'd call that proper reporting or straight reporting, I don't know. I think the sort of variety of platforms has blurred a lot of lines, but I think with it's sort of the market we're particularly talking about, so you know, the business reporting. I think there's a certain amount to which you, because you know some of the companies will be so extremely serious individuals, and they don't want a sort of reporter passing, you know, sweeping statements and judgments about their businesses. So I think it kind of polices itself up to a point in that respect. I mean, if you have opinions, you know, then. Uh, you need to couch them under the opinion sort of sections and websites and things still but it's in i i think there is room for personality in, in reporting i think there is room for for that and there wasn't in the old in the sort of the newspapers uh, i'm not saying the one's right and one's wrong but you do have to be very careful about it and you do have to be careful about how you present it um, and I think you'll soon find out if you start presenting sort of businesses in the wrong, uh, you know, if they sort of think you're overstepping the mark, they generally have a legal department or a, or some very busy um, sort, of, sort of PR person who will soon tell you that, you know, your comment isn't really justified in this. In this, It's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, yeah. I, and then you, then you sort of fold out into the, the individuals as well who will have, who will write particular sorts of reports which will be kind of fairly straight you know it's fairly well researched but on their social media platforms you know the same individuals will have quite open sort of banter with people and perhaps pass comment in the way the bbc reporters can't so there are sort of outlets in which you can sort of draw people into the uh, your world of and then they can sort of end up perhaps at your more considered story um some people are quite good at that as well that you know, um yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's, yeah. yeah, sorry, it's interesting because I think we're actually seeing, probably for the first time in this country, the, the, the two varieties that I think you get more in America, John. So if you turn on the, the TV in the morning, on the one side, you've got BBC Breakfast News, which is tries to be very BBC. You know, it, it, you know, it, 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 it gets to politicians, but does it in as fair a way as possible. You turn over and there's Piers Morgan, who of course, obviously was very successful in America. He's got no qualms. He is completely, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He rips politicians to bits. He's got his own opinion, which he tells you every other sentence. He's got Susanna Reid sitting next to him, to just smiling and trying to get a word in edgeways. And it's a different kind of reportage. And it's, it's very Marmite. I know people that think he's fantastic and he's almost like the leader of the opposition at the moment. And others that can't stand the guy. And, it, and I wonder if that's the way we're, we're moving, really. Um, to that kind of new, that more editorialising of news, um, and, and 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 Lois, you, you, as a as as a student, presumably you're still taught the more traditional way that we've got to keep it straight and everything. But you must see people like Piers Morgan, who basically creates news as well as reports it. And do people think, well, that's that's the kind of future I want to be involved in? What what do you think? Um, well, definitely, we get taught media law to make sure we don't step outside of what we're allowed to say. Um, I think with Piers Morgan and his um, reputation sort of helps him a lot. Um, I don't think someone that wasn't well known would get away with saying quite a lot of stuff that he does. Yeah. Um, so I think his like persona and everything does help him. Um, I think that sometimes he can say things that he like everyone is thinking, but maybe he doesn't do it in the right way, and sometimes he does overstep his boundary. Um, I think I think a lot of people want to be more honest in how they report, but it's definitely the way you go about that and address that. And 
with him as an example I don't always think he does it in the right way so I wouldn't I don't think people would go down his route especially but I think they definitely want to hear some more real news and real stories maybe not from such an impartial view yeah I should imagine John that Piers Morgan, who was on CNN for quite a long time, I think, he, he would be very mild compared to some of the people you see in America who front news shows in terms of opinions. Uh, is that right, or is that just the impression I get this side of the pond? Yes, that's that's definitely true. Um, yeah, that there's a... Um, well, I think, as, as I, yeah, I mentioned, you know, the, the regulatory oversight of broadcast in the US is is much less strict than it is in the UK. Uh, but if I may, Sam, i just I just like to, like, if I can be uh, sort of quite direct, I just think... I honestly think if, if we think about the kind of regional leader in the UK right now, like this is maybe the maybe this, this question isn't quite so relevant. I think the question probably is like, it's an existential one, like regardless of, of whether or not like, you know, whether or not we're conflating opinion with news or whatever, like then there's just this desperate need for innovation. Like if you've got a, if you've got, you know, the ability to write a slightly controversial column that's like focused on local affairs or like you know, covers a particular patch or whatever, if, it, if it's, you know, slightly more focused towards opinion than news, but you're able to get people to pay for it, then like, so be it. Like, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, back to like the 1600s or whatever in the UK, you know, people writing sort of pamphlets against the king and what have you, you know, that kind of entrepreneurial spirit i just think i think the uk can do better at a regional level and and you know absolutely there's this question of you know at, 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 at a national level like are we going to see this kind of conflation of, of opinion and, and news writing but you know if, if if we see more like more sort of for example regional like opinion 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 newsletters focusing on regional business and and that's like maybe a bit of a cost to, to kind of um straight impartial news reporting then you know, from my perspective, so so be it if it spurs if it spurs a bit more innovation. That's fascinating. I mean, we'll we'll we'll, we'll look at that now because we, where is it future? And one thing we haven't mentioned, and I'll and I'll, I'll come to Andrew on this one. We haven't talked a lot about social media, and it's it's, it's social. All right, let me put it this way: um, what is the most powerful um, journalistic tool in this country at the moment? Is it the regional press? Is it the BBC? Or is it Twitter and Facebook? Uh, climbing uh, that's a big question i yeah heaven knows um i i would you know social media is super powerful isn't it i mean um and you'd have to say so facebook's got a massive influence but in terms of the business community and the, um you know obviously our real people as well they do actually go on facebook too while their businesses may not be um, yeah, I'm sure it's hugely influential. Um, so whether they make any key decisions based on that, um, I'm not. I'm not so sure. Um, I think you know people do get their news off off a variety of platforms. I'd say a lot of people now, without thinking, they they probably go straight onto social media in the morning. Yeah. You know, at some point in the day, and they've got a habitual kind of way of doing it. They might go onto LinkedIn, they might go onto Facebook, but if they're business people in Gloucestershire, I'd suggest they go through LinkedIn and they go through Twitter. Uh, you know, they may dabble in Instagram as well, and then they maybe find something interesting on there. And then from there, they may well go to the source of that news, uh, you know, if they're really that bothered about it. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting one that, but I do think that. Um, it kind of business news is in, is slightly different. I think people want to be seen on a credible platform. If they're getting lots of action on Twitter and Facebook as well, uh, that benefits them. Yeah, absolutely great. But they'd like the source of that, the root of that, to be on a platform which is credible that they're happy to be on, and they were happy to support it as well. And they completely understand that you know it's the bigger picture too. If it's all about them, it ceases to be credible. Um, yeah, it's. It's interesting, yeah, where's the actual starting point for your news in the morning? Yeah. Some people it's the radio, you know, and some people it's Facebook. How about you, Lois? What's the first media you tune into in the morning? Well, I personally look at Twitter quite a lot. I think just because there's so many there's so many people on it and they've all got their own view and opinion that and it, it doesn't go through any screen or, or you're literally just getting their opinion, their view. And I think because of that, it is very influential because 
they're not getting screened through what they're saying and but with that app it may not be true like it's not going to always be correct which is why I do think people do trust news sources more because they go through more screening processes they do have to check their sources more than what someone can do on Twitter because what they can do on Twitter nothing does have to be correct and people can be wrongly influenced by the wrong people yeah it's, it's interesting about sources because it used to be a very a big frustration for those of us in if you like the traditional media that if we'd heard that for example a celebrity had passed away we would have to get three or four sources before you would ever go with it you watch the bbc is normally one of the last people to confirm people because on twitter one person rumor and it's out there but traditional news sources had the same so so what about you john what's your first new source of the morning when you want to wake up what happened well overnight while you were asleep what's the first thing you do um i sort of i tend to say the financial newspapers for me are most important um the wall street journal financial times um and then yeah sometimes i sort of catch up on metro metro news from um the new york times and actually there's also in in, in new york city there's a um an interesting community news outlook or patch which um yeah covers the sort of local local area um so that's that's my news source those, those are my sort of main news sources um it's very interesting because it comes back to what, what lois was saying earlier that the first three things you mentioned were very big brands financial yeah. times and wall street journal um and and it it got, is it does this come back to almost full circle really that you know people trust brands and how you deliver it then is is how you it, it, it will change and it has changed and it's changed beyond belief but those brands survive is that the most precious thing that any any news outlet whatever they are has got its reputation its brand what would you say i think absolutely i mean for me for me the reason i i i sort of try to check the news sources that i know my sources will be reading and you know in the financial markets and the insurance and reinsurance industry you know the majority of of executives are reading are still reading publications where they know they can get, you know, a reliable, informed view of what's going on in the wider world, but also high quality information about their particular niche interests, which might be you know, banking, or it might be um, uh, insurance, or it might be you know, asset management or hedge fund, like you know, what's going on in the world of hedge funds, and and those those publications do a good job of catering to those readers' mm. interests, which at some point become absolute needs rather than rather than once if you're running a you know a large publicly traded company yeah i just i could briefly mention there we've talked about newspapers we've talked about websites about social media we've talked about broadcast to a certain extent um where does radio fit into the picture has radio still got a role with business journalism journalism generally is that something that um will still be around in its current form as a news outlet if you like in five ten years time or is radio very much a in the past what, what do we think are you, are you a radio listener lois or would you get any news from radio or is it an entertainment source for you for me it is just entertainment really and it's normally just in the car um to be honest and i do get like there is between breaks there's always like where news does come on so i do listen to it but mainly it is entertainment um but even though i only use it for entertainment i do think that radio radio will never die I, I think there is always a market for it because people do less and and even with um like sh live uh, streams of like radio stations people watch them even if it's not just through a radio they can watch it on different platforms mm -hmm. and they've got the visual element to it so even though like it's not the same con like way of consuming it like it there is still a place for it Good point. Andrew, is, is radio news for you or entertainment? It's it's, uh, it's a bit of both uh, for me. I do stick the radio, I stick the national radio on in the morning, um, which will be either five live or radio four, depending on how I'm feeling. Um, and yeah, I do follow that through. I find that really helpful for the bigger pictures. And I think the way they sum things up is great. Um, but um so local radio, I, mean, I do listen to BBC Radio Gloucestershire a little bit. Um, you know, I think um, Mark Cummings sort of shows some of the little features he has on there to do with business. I really like those. I like some of the, uh, you know, he brings in some of the local experts. I'm sure you've been on there. 
um, you know, and we'll sort of talk about what's happening in Gloucestershire. And he's able to get under the skin of things a little bit more, a little bit more flexibility in that. So, yeah, I, I think there's, um, you know, I think there's a future in it. It's, it's, it's sort of holding that audience, isn't it, and sort of keeping that going. That's the thing. And I think that comes down to what John was saying. That is content. Again, you know, it's relevant content or it's relevant content are presented in the right way. I don't think you have to uh, sort of stick whistles and bells on it like uh, some people do. But, um, you know, again, it's kind of playing to your audience a bit, isn't it? I, I mean, something we haven't touched on there, we mentioned sort of brands, but I think if you're drilling down into regional, I don't know what you guys think, but there's, um, you know, like the provenance of food, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, you scratch beneath the surface of some of the companies, and I think people are doing that now is increasingly at this moment. And, you know, so shouting about Rake's Journal, the whole element of that was meant to be about that. Um, you know, all its money ran through the Gloucestershire Credit Union. It was kind of very much like that. Well, the company I've moved to are actually, they don't market themselves like it. It's actually a Gloucestershire family business. Mm. It's founded here, it's rooted here, it's completely organically grown, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but that's really powerful because a lot of businesses are looking at it now and they're wondering about one or two other platforms that we know and saying, well, so I'm getting phone calls from out of the county about my sort of advertising support now. They don't even know, you know, it's whereabouts in Gloucestershire I'm from. And, and it's starting to have an impact. So if you have that, you know, that's an element of it. It's not going to win sort of the war, but it's an important element in regional, you know, if you are really from your patch and you really care. Uh, there's value in that again you've got to get the content right otherwise uh, you can be from your patch or you like um but but you know you've got to get the other bits right and i think having uh someone like the university of gloucester here someone like sort of lois you know who's coming through the next generation you know that is is also going to help fuel and shape some of these you know like the platform i'm on now some of the people from there i mean they're really clever bright young people who didn't come from the world we've come from at all and they're bringing a new thing to the sort of table and shaping things sort of fresh and i think that's interesting that seems to be capturing an audience too so you know um I agree with that. And I think I'll just come to John just to quickly back the radio. But I think the fact that John's out there in, a, in, in America doing this fascinating sounding job at, at a relatively young age is such progress because we, we, we hinted at this before when we talked about that journalism used to be sort of a, a age related. You could almost tell where someone was on the becking order about how old they were. Now, I think <laughs> younger people are doing some just a, a, an amazing job. So um, and I think that's very exciting. So, John, just a quick line, just to put the line of that. Is radio still key in America? Is it still a, a, a player in the media market? Um, Sam, I think it's uh, less about the medium, completely about the content. You know, if, it doesn't matter whether it's a podcast or whether it's, a, you yeah. know, what used to be analog radio is delivered digitally or if it's, you know, you know on, on your on an iPhone or whatever. Like, you know, there's still people um, people are, are busy and having, you know, inter like colourful interviews, um, audio interviews that, uh, you know, that, that really make people think while they're you know, doing other things or doing the washing up or, up or whatever. Like I think there is absolutely still a market for that. Yeah. I mean, and I think, do you know what? I think if there's a theme that's emerging from this and I'm actually really pleased about it because it's a theme that ran throughout my entire career and it looks like it's continuing. Content is king. Three words. That's what it's all about because you can have the best looking, um, I mean, in newspapers, we very often have a revamp of the paper and we spend ages doing new designs and everything and the sales wouldn't change. And you realise that that's it's a, it's about what you feel about the newspaper, but people just care about the words. The words is so important and that's something we're all sort of committed to. So um, let's let's take that forward then a little bit and just say, um, you know, so much has changed in the last 10, 15, 20 years with media, be that very localised media or international media, whatever. Um, where are we going? Where do you think the media is going to look? And I know this is an almost impossible question to answer, but heck, why not try? Uh, Ten years from now, what will the media landscape look like for business, for local, for international, whatever way you want to look at it? What do you think the media, what, what job do you think you're going to have in 10 years time, Lois, as somebody that's yet to start their first full time job in journalism? Have you any idea? I have no clue. I'm not going to lie. I do not know what's going to happen. Like. I think that the industry is just moving so fast and especially in like the past 20 years 
the growth of uh, it's been so rapid with like the digital like digital advancements that I think new technologies and everything is coming out so quickly that I it's really hard to predict because just everything is changing so fast there's always new um platforms coming out there's always new ideas that like jobs that exist today like may have not even existed five years ago let alone 20 so I just think things are changing so fast that it's going to be so difficult to predict I think you're right I think I've read somewhere that the top 10 jobs wanted by 18 to 21 year olds none of them existed 10 years ago as you were saying um which, which says a lot so um john bit of crystal ball gazing where do you think the media landscape will look like in 20 whatever <laughs> 31 i think we've been through a, a period of extraordinary disruption um you know i think it's useful to look at parallels or just look at other industries and think of kind of you know other breaking points in time maybe you know the invention of the motor car in the, the beginning of the 20th century when suddenly a thing that was made by artisans in workshops um, uh, became a, a manufactured product with, you know, um, uh, where every, every worker would just make the same little spring over and over again rather than manufacturing the whole car. Um, and there was you know, massive disruption that resulted in, in, you know, widespread, you know, companies just folding like that, um, followed by uh a, a, you know a period by a, a period in which regulators began to catch up like governments began to understand nation states began to understand how how this particular market had changed which resulted in in greater stability for innovation and i think the next 10 15 years look actually look quite exciting um we're beginning to get to a place where people have more of an understanding of of how the how the disruptors function and how they have worked over the last 15 years and they don't like it like consumers don't you know, as we've seen just from, you know, the various laws that have been passed in in Westminster, in Brussels, in California around, you know, data protection. People don't like the, like, they don't like platforms that can, that, that consume, uh, that aren't honest about their value proposition. And I think there's a big opportunity for, for journalists, whether it's large, you know, medium-sized media groups or just individual reporters, like willing to just, you know, strike out on their own and, and give, and be willing to fail. I think people are a lot more tolerant of of, of, of failure and, and a lot more appreciative of the value that the industry brings. And so, you know, my hope anyway is that the next you know fifteen years we'll see and it's beginning to happen in the US, you know, like established journalists thinking, you know what, actually, you know, my content is more valuable than than the platform. So I'll just do it myself. I'll I'll you know, we we're seeing, you know, Substack and these other platforms that, that are existing to allow people to sell their, 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 to offer the value, to underline and sell their content directly to people in a way that really, you know, underscores the value proposition. So hopefully we'll see more of that. Mm. Right. It's quite dem democratizing in a way, isn't it? If you think about it, that, that mm. sort of people have, the, the power goes back to the journalist rather than the person that employs a journalist. So uh, fascinating. And just, just one thing to add, Sam, like, that, that doesn't mean that we're going to see, you know, we won't see some extraordinary stuff. I mean, I was just thinking about the yeah, sale yeah. of the Scotsman newspaper in January. You know, it was sold for 10 million, I think, to to a private equity, uh, to a um, uh, a new invest, an investment company run by a former national newspaper editor. And in in 2000, uh, I think it was in 2007 or 2008. You know, the John Johnston Press bought that business for something like 180 million. Like the value destruction is just extraordinary. Incredible, incredible. Um, what about you, Andrew? Would you, two things: a where do you see things going, and b do you wish you were in Lois's shoes, just about to start your journalistic career, or would you be a bit <laughs> frightened by that? <laughs> yeah, oh, God. Um, yeah, where do I... But I actually agree with most of what John said there. In fact, almost all of it, having been there and thought, well, you know, what I do, mm. I just got value outside of any platform, and I, I think, you know, what I did prove that in a small way. I mean, it's, you know... But um, I do... I kind of think... It's when the big old sort of cash cows, uh, which are now limping towards a, a you know, uh, uh, they will fall at some point. So, you know, when the big local groups and that are out of the way, I think you'll see something good come out of it. I think they need to get out of the way first. Um, uh, you know, um, I think um, it is an exciting time. I do think... Um, 
all those pieces will start to come back together and form something new and exciting. I think sort of Lois will be part of that as well. You know, would I like to be by that? I mean, I guess you'd always like to kind of start again, wouldn't you? And go, yeah, well, let's go and, you know, let's go and give it another bash, uh, which would be fantastic. I, I think that um, it's, it's um, probably five years ago, 10 years ago, especially looking for, I think there's a lot of doom and gloom around. I think we've come through that. I think uh, 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 there is optimism. It's not necessarily certainty, but there's a lot of optimism because as John said, I think people uh, want that content. They will always want that content. They want some something, uh, uh, you know, they might want a fun platform, whatever as well, but they also want some reliable journalism still. And I think they'll always want it. Um, you know, it may be that it's 250 words long. It may be that it's 60 seconds long on a video. So it may be both of those things. It'll be a combination of all sorts of stuff. Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really enthused when I see new people come into the profession mm-hmm. who bring that fresh perspective because that's what will keep sort of me on my toes. And I learn more from those people than I, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, I learn how to, to carry on doing what I do, really. Uh, 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 yeah, so could I turn back? Uh, could I start again? Yes, please. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Well, I mean, I'm an optimistic chap, and I think um, when we start off by agreeing that print wasn't dead, it just it's going to get better. That's that's a great starting point. So let's end. We've got, we're coming to that on, on an optimistic note about about the, the future, if you like, of, of, of media and um what would you like to tell anybody watching, you know, that make them feel better about their media? Because some people have fallen out of love with the media, let's be honest, for, for whatever reason, they, mm-hmm. they, they, they doubt our uh, intentions sometimes maybe. Um, what, what positive notes should we end on? I mean, I, I, I definitely think that the, the, if we all believe, subscribe to the theory that content is king, then we're, we're, we're halfway there. But what do other people think? John, what optimistic message would you put out about, the future of this incredible and very varied industry. I'm desperately passionate about the fourth estate, Sam. Um, I think that, you know, whether you're a participant in a community or a market or a citizen, having having people who are out there repeatedly, like repeatedly asking questions about um, on your behalf, is just really, it's really valuable. And, you know, journalists who are, you know, generally speaking, journalists who are worth, worth their salt are really receptive as well. You know, we're not, you know, we're not these big, like, you know, elitist ogres is it's, it's this idea that, you know, we, we, we are hungry to ask questions and to interact with people and, and, and be, you know, cam- campaign in the sense that we are willing to ask vociferate, like ask questions vociferously on, on behalf of people and communities. And, and it's, it's been, it's been really, if you think over the centuries, it's been really important. And I think it, it will still continue to be very important. Excellent. Uh, Andrew, what about you? Uh, optimistic notes to say the, the future of the media. I think, as I said, we are through a sort of a fairly dark time and a sort of disruptive time, and I think some new models are emerging, which are really, really promising. And um, I think that, uh, like John, I don't think that need for um, sort of the right questions, um, need for the right people who can write that or present that, uh, uh, you know, I don't think that will ever go away. Um, and I think people are seeing the value of that, especially what's happened the last few years. Um, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, politically, um, in terms of Trump's Brexit, the whole thing, no matter which way you want to swing with that, it's, it's you could say if you had better reporting and some, some better question asking throughout those whole processes, you'd have a lot, uh, the outcomes might be the same, but you'd have a lot happier Sort of mindset amongst individuals um, and uh, they wouldn't have to swallow so much of um, uh, uh, you know sort of chatter really I think it's a really optimistic time to be to, sort of uh, to be coming into the profession uh, you know and, uh, and for the people who want uh, people to be held to account so want to read interesting content you know so it might be about uh, football so it might be about local government it might be about business I think there's still an appetite uh, for that and to see people like Lois coming through and uh, generate, I think their course is oversubscribed at the university, um, you know, so there's this appetite is there. It's, it's there at sort of every angle. Um, yeah, I 
sort of hope it continues forever. Yeah, me too. And, and I always say that if anyone ever doubts the importance or the power of the media, you watch any country in the world where there's a military coup, the first place the soldiers are sent to is the local TV station, the radio station, and the newspapers. And they mm -hmm. take control of them because they realise how important they are. So it, it seems fitting, really, to finish on a, uh, looking at the future with somebody who is the future. Um, well, you both are, John and Andrew, but Lois even more so. Lois, um, you came into this profession. I'm sure there was people probably saying to you, I'll do a course in medicine or, or the law. <laughs> you, have, you have better pay and there's more chance of a job, but something made you want to be a journalist. So what is it and, and what makes you feel confident for the future? I mean, journalists, for me, journalism is something for the people. You are getting information out there that needs to be heard. And I think what sort of enticed me to come to it is there's always going to be information. There's always going to be content. There's never going to be a lack of that. So there is always going to be a place for you in the media, in the world of media. And I think just getting that information out there and making it clear that it is for the right intentions is really important. And that's just sort of what like, drew me to the course and that I wanted to be a journalist was just the ability to get, not even my voice, but get people's voices heard that needs to be heard. Perfect. I can't think of a better way to finish, really. That's um, brilliant. Thank yeah. you for that, Lois. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for Business Insights for uh, allowing us to have this discussion. Thank you for watching or listening or, or whichever way you consume your news, as we decided. There's plenty of ways of doing it. Um, I think that's been a really interesting discussion. And as, as an old hack, I'm very, very encouraged for the future listening to Lois, John and Andrew speaking. So thank you for watching and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.